Joe presents Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby, together with Guinness. Hello and welcome to Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby here on Joe, together with Guinness. Welcome to episode three. Uh, Andrew, how are you doing? I'm great. I'm great, Barry. Cool, cool. Uh, Good to you have you back. Did, did you have a pleasant weekend? I did. Uh, I had a great weekend. What a weekend to be uh, in Ireland with the bank holiday. You know, everyone's just kind of relaxed. Obviously, well, you don't have bank holidays up north. Right? No, we do have you bank do. holidays. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But just not this one. No, yeah, this one, um, uh, unfortunately, I was working yesterday. Oh, God, man. You missed out. Majorly, I think it's my favorite of all bank holidays. It just breaks up the year so nicely. The weather was incredible. There's so much going on. There was music festivals all over the country. There was, you know, the Cork Jazz Festival, Dingle Folk Fest. There was GAA County Finals and Semi Finals. A ton of uh, <coughs> Guinness Pro 14 <laughs> rugby, obviously. Uh, so no doubt you um, used your day off to. To do something productive and have a good time. And I kind of watched Hocus Pocus in the morning <laughs> and Casper uh, in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, but I went to see Bohemian Rhapsody at two o'clock yesterday, which was a very solid bank holiday Monday. And I know you saw it Saturday night. I saw it Saturday. It was a, uh, our date night. It's my wife's birthday this week, so that was our date night. Oh, what a brilliant date. Yeah, it was class. Isn't it? Absolutely class. Yeah. So inspiring. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was watching it the whole time thinking, Barry's so lucky he's in a band. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like Queen. Yeah, yeah. well, I was just, just exactly like that. You do have a bit of a Freddie Mercury vibe. <laughs> Thank you, man. He's the greatest rock star of all time. Although I, I said <coughs> initially that you're halfway between Bublé and Amy Winehouse. Right. I don't think Freddie Mercury fits that. Is he not? Sh surely he's even beyond Winehouse. Yeah, true. He's certainly up there with Winehouse anyway. Yeah, he's pretty. He was pretty out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was a, obviously a very sad story, but so inspiring, and uh, funny. And what I loved about it was you get to see the birth of all those incredible songs that we've all grown up with. Those anthems. They're like anthems to the yeah. gods. Yeah. You know, and like he, I think they were Queen's greatest hits was the first album I ever bought after my. First Holy Communion money, I went and I bought a Walkman and Queen's Greatest Hits at seven, so seven years of age. So that was like wow, yeah, so it yeah. Was, it was brilliant, that, wasn't it? Wasn't it? It was cla just the, the the build up the whole way along the story, the the kind of mm. the amount of times they fell out with each other, and then the next day they're like grand, we're friends again, we're gonna go back making music, having a good time, mm. and it was building, building up, building up all the way to to Live Aid and the whole kind of movie climax is at Live Aid, yeah. and. Just before the live aid scene, my missus turns around and says, I'm really thirsty, you wouldn't get me a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you. So you, didn't, you didn't do it. <laughs> I did, yeah. Oh my God, you're like the best husband on the planet. Yeah, anyway. Wow. Got so, it done. I yeah. was, I was, to yeah. be fair, I was back within 30 seconds. Okay. Sprinted still, down that. You still got it. Yeah. I still got it. Yeah. I think uh, we, we, we recorded our album in a place called, our last EP, with Hermitage Green, the band, in a place called Rockfield Studios, which is a very famous uh, studio in North Wales. And if you've seen that film, they recorded Night at the Opera. I don't know if you remember that moment where they go to that farmhouse yes. and they record. Is so that where that was? That's where that was. So wow. We, I was watching it going, oh my God, this is where it happened. And uh, when we went to this studio, <coughs> one of the reasons we went there, we knew they recorded Night at the Opera there. Uh, you know, Oasis recorded, definitely maybe there. Uh, Coldplay recorded Parachutes and it's got a lot of history. Yeah. So he went there and it's just an old farm that this dude owns. His name is Kingsley and he just wanders around the place. He's a proper farmer and he just rents it out to people when they want to come and record. Wow. So there's so much history in the walls. There's nothing, there's nothing hanging or anything like that. There's no pictures. But when we got there, he'd wander into the studio every once in a while. And when he does, you just have to sit back and listen to him and let him go off. And he came in one day and he was like, um, do you see that wind chime out there? And there's like, or it wasn't wind chime, it was one of those wind uh, arrows, you know, with north, south, east uh -huh. and west on it. And he's like, when Queen were recording uh, Night at the Opera, Freddie was here and he was sitting down there at the piano and he just looked out and he said, and the wind was blowing it around. And he said, anyway, the wind blows, that's where he came up with the lyric. <laughs> and I was like, that's got to be bullshit, but it's brilliant. <laughs> I'm going with it. He so sounds like the, the music equivalent of Rala. Yes, exactly. Paddy O'Reilly, yeah. the, the Irish bagman. Yeah. Just a storyteller. Yeah. 
he has massive purpose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he can he can go off on tangents Brilliant. all the time. Yeah. So all the big names then, Queen, Coldplay, yeah. Oasis yeah. and uh what you call Stone you Roses, Hermitage Green, obviously <laughs> Hermitage yeah, we're in the same. So uh so yeah, it was um it was it was a, it was great. I, I loved it. So anyway, yeah, there was Plenty going on at the weekend, I had a lovely time. I also watched a ton of rugby. Obviously the Guinness Pro 14 kicked back into action. And it's hard not to start with Munster's uh, very exciting win in Thoma Park on Saturday night and Rory Scannell's incredible kick. We were hoping to have Rory Scannell on the phone this morning, but he's actually flying from Dubai to South Africa at the moment. So you're gonna take his place, Andrew, as Rory Scannell. Um, okay, that should be, that's fine. That's okay, so you can talk us through that last couple of minutes and the decision to take the kick uh -huh. and the pressure. Because like Andrew, if he was here, would obviously couldn't kick shite off a rope. So we snow, need snow off, snow off a rope, same thing. <clears throat> so yeah, what do you think? Did you, did, you, uh, did you see that last couple of minutes in the Monster game? And I did, yeah. Um, as you say, there's, there's so many talking points in the last five minutes, like yeah. almost as many as there were in the entire game. Uh, but obviously, Pete O'Mahony with the turnover, you could see he was just he was just snooping about behind the defensive line. Did you see him say to Stander, "Yes, that was so good." I know. What did he, like we just said, like take the latch. You could see he was just. He could see the way that um, Glasgow were shaping up. Mm. Yeah, take the latch, whatever the call was, and you who take was out it? The latch, I'll get on the ball. Yeah, who, yeah. it was someone on the inside as well. It might have been. John Klein, or could it be Billy Holland? Anyway, Billy Holland, I think. Billy Holland, yeah, yeah. yeah. and he kind of. He, he was kind of blocking off on the inside. Stander was blocking off on the outside. Totally illegal. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but it worked an absolute treat. Yeah. And for me, Pete was off his feet as well. He was. His studs were in the air. Yeah, the ref was just on the other side of the rock. Yes, you can see, it. yeah. But I think that last five minutes, and even the last 10 minutes, like, I, it was so interesting to see Glasgow's tactics, fair play, and they stuck at it. They didn't kick the ball much in the game. Yeah. And they could have just drilled it into the corner a couple of times and, and you know, kept it out of their half, but they continue to just play rugby. <clears throat> and Munster, they were, we were going to find it hard to get the ball off them. So it's just like a matter of trying to drive them back and use line speed to get off the line, either chop them or hold them up and try and force them back. And they actually got them from their own 10 meter line just to the half, just before the halfway. And then <clears throat> obviously every inch counts when you're trying to get a penalty or, or with a potential shot at goal. Yeah. So for, for them to get like, for that intent at that at that late in the game, for Pete to have that quick decision to go, get off the line, take the latch out, get him on the ground, get a penalty. I mean, yeah. that's that's next level stuff. I was yeah. so impressed with that. No, it was really. They, they looked they looked really composed. They looked really kind of structured. They looked like they've they've coached that. Mm. I'm sure there's a Van Grand kind of stamp on that. Yeah. And just organize orchestrating the whole situation so Pete can get in the ball. <clears throat> Pete was doing. I don't know if you've ever seen. Pocock does that quite a bit. Um, I know when we were playing Australia a few years ago, Sean O'Brien made that point. He always just kind of hovers behind the line so that when someone falls long, mm. then they've just got a second to get in the ball. And Pocock obviously yeah. uh, can, you know, can be on that really quickly, but Pete did that. And there was about three or four phases just before. Pete was like just floating in behind, in behind the rock at one stage. He went around to the open side and then he floated it back around because at that stage, who cares if your line's short? Mm. It's actually, it might work better in Glasgow or in, um, Monster's favour if Glasgow try and play, try and play with width because they'll cough the ball up, they might throw an intercept, they're not yeah. going to do that. So mm. just shorten your line, take risks with your defence. Yeah. That's what he did and he just, just popped on the ball and yeah. uh, it was unbelievably well executed. Yeah, I loved how he was uh, <coughs> he was incapacitated then, he was lying on the ground for, for whatever reason, couldn't make a decision whether they kick to the corner or kick a goal. I think Billy Holland was, was uh, put up as the captain for that split moment and he looked like he was being a typical Billy and like playing it a little bit safe, let's put it in the corner and all that. <laughs> so I think Simon Zeebo came out on Instagram and was slagging him for, for potentially trying to force their hand in that way. And uh, I'd love to know who made the decision, whether it was Scans. I mean, he hadn't kicked the ball all day. And then to, you know, what is, he's worked very hard, his legs are probably heavy. Yeah. And then to make the decision, yeah, I'm going to have a pop. Uh, 80 minute of the game, you know, Tom and Park, where so many moments have happened like that throughout the years, and, and to have that one moment for yourself, and oh God, I don't know how kickers do it, man. In I that wonder situation. though, it, as a kicker in that situation, if if he's honest, would he be thinking, right, I could take this, where I'm not going to get a hard time if I miss it, or 
I'd maybe prefer this than one 30 metres out right in front because yeah. you're a nervous wreck. You're thinking, That's true, yeah, I yeah. cannot miss this. Yeah, yeah. So almost that's some, probably a more comfortable kick. Yeah. Obviously, it's still incredibly, uh, it's, it's an unbelievable kick that he got it. So, I mean, credit where credit's due. I'm just thinking, I wonder in the mindset of a, of a, of a kicker. I've never been there. So, mm. as you say, I couldn't kick snow yeah. off a rope. I, I, yeah, me too. Like, I'm useless. But I do feel I, I sometimes play a part. I have this thing that I pray to the gods of the kicking, <laughs> uh, the kicking gods, and I only use it very occasionally. Uh -huh. I used to use it, I used it once with Barry Keishan. He was a, uh -huh. a dolphin uh, out half, and I played under 21s against uh, Leinster with him. And I used it then, and I was like, make a name for yourself, man. Come on, kicking gods, let him get this. And he got it, last kick <coughs> of the game, he won it. I used it for Raj when uh, Munster beat Gloucester in that miracle match, and we needed the last kick of the game to, yeah. to, to get through top of the group. And I used it for Raj against Leicester once in Welford Road, where yeah. uh, we were a point down and we won by a point. And uh, yeah, so I'd like to take some sort of a, Did I used it the night. I, I got up on my on my seat and I was like, "Come on, let let this be a moment." Okay, you still had some credit. <laughs> yeah. So you used up it. four. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. at what stage does that run out? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Man. I'm just that's why I'm so wary when I use it. Yeah. But I thought the other night was such a perfect moment. I think. And you've got every it. one that you've used. Yeah. Yeah, I have. Wow. Yeah. Well, fair play I, to I, you. I, I totally could be making that up. <laughs> <laughs> go on, go you on. know what? Scanlon's not the hero. O'Mahony's not the hero. No. You're the hero. Yeah, thanks, man. You deserve all the credit you're getting. I hate to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, other than that, it was a pretty fascinating game. I enjoyed the tactic, tactics of both sides. I think uh, Munster would have gone out looking to enforce their set piece and uh, Glasgow didn't allow them to do that. It didn't kick the ball at all. I think Munster had six lineouts in the whole game, which would have taken massively from you know, their tactics and their platform. Um, Glasgow then had so much open field running and scored some Pretty thought, brilliant, 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 brilliant. brilliant. Yeah, I don't. Were. I don't think they deserved to lose the game. No, they yeah. really didn't. Yeah. I thought they were brilliant for most of the game. Really, yeah. they, they kind of lost it themselves, <coughs> man. I think with that last few minutes, it was bizarre the way they were playing. They had a kick to touch off a penalty that they put pretty much straight across the yeah. field, rather yeah. than you know trying to drill it in the corner. But um, you know, credit where credit's due. I think the intensity the monster showed for that last few minutes were, you know, a credit to their coaching staff. I think the the you know, we've both played with Fla and Felix and we know like the two of the fittest are probably the two fittest players I've ever played with and the most intense. So I think they're bringing that level to the Munster side at the moment where that's what they expect from from the side is to in that final few minutes be able to dig it out. And I think the likes of CJ Stander really stood up. He's, <coughs> he's had an interesting few weeks. I think he's been targeted by a lot of teams over the last few weeks and last few months. He got hit hard. Mm. He got he got met really physically by um, by the Glasgow back row a couple of times. Yeah. Have you ever seen Stander get upended, get knocked back the way he got knocked back at the weekend? Yeah. The intensity was really high and there was, a little, there was a few scuffles early on as well and I think that kind of just created a tone Goodness. of kind of dislike or yeah. frustration and then that kind of made it more of a spectacle for the rest of yeah. us. Is there, yeah, there's a bit of a bite there. <laughs> Did you ever have a bit of a bite with, with Glasgow? Yeah, little bits and pieces. Um, in the past, actually, our Ulster coaches would have fallen out with Glasgow coaches and like there would have been a few scuffles on the pitch. Really, yeah. The reason I remember one in particular, uh, it was a hilarious moment whenever um, uh, Ryan Wilson um, started screaming at Pinar on the ground, like just, I can't remember what he was shouting, just like, I could shout an abuse at him. And then <laughs> Pete Brown, our um, English second row, posh guy from Cheltenham, just retired last week actually, um, said, Oi! It's after the watershed. <laughs> <laughs> Does that even mean? <laughs> yeah, mind your language. Oh, Jesus. I know, uh, we just thought this has gone from really intense and really narky to hilarious yeah, yeah. <laughs> within one moment. So yeah, I love those moments. That was one of the few moments that was <laughs> diffused. You can't take it too seriously. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, look, I think it, it made for a great game having that kind of physicality. And, you know, I think there was a lot of people that raised their hands for for Joe of the Schmidt's uh, teams over the next coming weeks and you know looking at the the squad that he picked going to Chicago this week for uh, for the Italy match any surprises in there for you or uh, what do you think of the potential starting 15 that that uh, he might pick have you any yeah I think we're we're 
we're both big fans of Will, uh, Will Addison. He's gone unbelievably, unbelievably mm. well at the start of the season. He's in the mix there. New caps, Ross Byrne, and there's one more new cap. Who's that? Uh, one more <laughs> new cap. There's three new cabs anyway. Good question. Um, but I think uh, obviously then Ireland are going to go play a few guys who kind of be bench recover or maybe mm. uh, not not all the big all the cool mm. dudes all the big names are at home. Mm. Still a very exciting team. Mm -hmm. um, for me, like if he went with Byrne and James Ryan in the second row, like what a pairing that is! How exciting yeah. that is to have the two of those guys. Their physicality, their intensity, their ability to carry over the gain line. Um, you know, the back row, whether he'll go with, you know, I think Ruddock will probably captain the side. He's had a huge few months for Leinster. Um, Van der Fleer um, has been excellent. Mm -hmm. Conan has been excellent. Um, Byrne, I think, was the other. Was it Byrne was the other one that, uh, yeah. that uncapped? Yeah. Yeah. So whether he goes with Byrne or, or Carberry, McGrath or Cooney, <coughs> any of those combinations, you know, they're pretty, pretty excellent in, in how they've been managing the last few weeks for their clubs. Yeah. Um, You'd imagine you'd go Carberry. You think so? Yeah, I would have thought so, yeah. Mm. I'd go Carberry and then for, it's a toss up between Luke and Cooney. I suppose the only kind of logical way to look at it is that Cooney was kind of in the driving seat in June. Um, uh, when he got picked for tour ahead of Luke, and since then he hasn't really put a foot wrong, mm -hmm. and there's the kicking option as well, which isn't make or break, but if it's a 50 50, then it's going to go in his favour. So for me, it's probably uh, Cooney Carberry, cool. 9 and 10. That's pretty exciting. Isn't it? A set of halfbacks, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, with the centre partnership, I think. I reckon he'd probably go with Aki and Ringrose personally, maybe Addison on the bench. I do love the way Addison's playing at the moment. Like, as a 13, that's that's what you're looking for for me. Mm -hmm. From a 13, he's got that intent to play. He controls uh, fourth and fifth phase by the looks of things for Ulster. He knows when to make those decisions and to when to go out the back door. Or he knows how to create space, which is, is huge. <clears throat> but I think Ringrose obviously is... His, uh, his, has been brilliant for both Ireland and Leinster for the last <coughs> couple of years. I think he deserves a start with Aki as 12. Um, but great to have Addison on the bench. And then if, if Ringrose is going to start at 13, uh, I mean, he's not likely to start Italy, Argentina, New Zealand, surely, is he? I don't know. Yeah. Someone to partner Henshaw anyway for, for the big games, I suppose, the Argentina and the New Zealand game. Um, and he could go Henshaw, Aki, I suppose. Um, or as you say, well, Allison might get his um, yeah. foot in the door there, depending if he gets an opportunity in in Chicago. Um, yeah, I think there's plenty going on, isn't there? The, like isn't a there? few years ago, you're going. The, the, I mean, the the lesson that they learned at the World Cup was you cannot afford to get three or four injuries in key positions. That's it. And now, well, they can. Yeah, they can do what they want, and yeah. there's guys coming in, putting their hands up, and there's serious, serious talent and serious depth in all positions now, and it's a it's a luxury that Joe's got, and it makes things a lot more difficult for players fighting for positions, doesn't it? It does. Even like the likes of Stockdale and Larmer and Conway <coughs> coming in here, like I mean, what an exciting back three if that's what he goes with. Um, Sean Cronin, if he starts, I mean, you know, he's you know, he himself and Scannell, to be fair, have been have been brilliant. So to have that luxury to leave those guys on the at home for the next for this week is is brilliant and. Very exciting times for Irish rugby and, and looking forward to the, to the New Zealand game in a few weeks. There's going to be a lot of headaches for sure. Um, the Italy team, have you had a look at that? Yeah, it's a young team. It's a fairly inexperienced team, captained by um, Capagnaro, mm -hmm. which I didn't realise. Kind of he, I don't know if he's ever been captain before. I didn't realise he was that kind of role. But he's obviously one of the most experienced guys in that team, but um, obviously uh, yeah, they'll be coming over looking to play a bit of rugby. Yeah, I was surprised that they went with such a young team and an experienced team. I think it was a good chance for them to potentially get a scalp and against Ireland with a, with you know the world watching. But um, again, that's it's never going to be easy against this Irish side. But yeah, I think it's going to be a great game. To be honest, it's a spectacle over there. You've been there. You know what it's like to play yeah. in these big games. So, um, so yeah, exciting times. And just to let you know that because we're into this test window now and with uh, 
Ireland in Chicago and then the Guinness Series coming up in Dublin in the Aviva Stadium. We're going to go with twice a week for Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby. So it's twice the crack, twice the content. A new episode will drop on Thursday featuring our Ireland versus Italy predictions. Uh, we'll answer any Twitter questions you have. And also we've got an exclusive interview with Connor Murray. And when I say exclusive, I mean completely inexclusive because he <laughs> spoke to everyone <laughs> last week. But uh, I reckon I, I asked him a few questions that no one else would ask. Um, so here's a little taster of that Conor Murray interview right now. They're a better team than us. Like, yeah. and it's rare you feel like that. Rare, oh, you'll always be like, oh, we should have scored a try there and that would have been it. But like, they were actually, they're just a better team at the moment. Yeah. And we've been to semi-finals and two semi-finals last year, so we're not a million miles away. They were an English team. And we were like the best team in Ireland. We'd have, we'd be a lot feeling a lot better. You know what I mean? It's a yeah. weird situation, but um, ultimately they drive you on to, to get better to as get a better. province and, and compete. And so close, so so close. Yeah. So the um, the old Munster Leinster rivalry and uh, the inevitable kind of comparisons. If you're um, not quite, if you're not quite Leinster and you're Munster or you're Ulster, then in, in my experience with Ulster, we, we always had this mindset where we were like, stop saying Leinster, stop saying the way Ireland do things or the way Leinster do things. Let's do things the way we want to do them. And then that would go a couple of weeks and then, and then <laughs> someone, would, someone would go, look at the way Leinster are doing that. You, know, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You, can't help, you can't help compare yourself to your interprovincial rival that's just down the road and they're doing something subtly but better, more efficient, and they're, they're getting more traction from doing something. There's something about their setup that you emulate and uh, it's it's very flattering for uh, for Leinster to be in that position, and then obviously the likes of Monster, Ulster, Connacht. That's the big that's the big game for them. They they that's the big rivalry. That's the the game that they get motivated to win that game. So those games are always more intense. They're always more driven to beat Leinster. Um, and again, that's just a, that's a compliment to Leinster the way they're doing stuff. So yeah, I yeah, agree. I think it's a. I think it's a good thing. It's a healthy thing, and as you hear from Connor there, like they're, they you know that that inspires them or, or drives them on to, to become better and better. So yeah, so tune in for yeah. um, the the second um, yeah, edition the, of, of Barry and that's Andrew. It. Don't forget to subscribe Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby and listen to our chat with Connor Murray on Thursday uh, or check it out on YouTube. Is the is the English House of Rugby have they got um, two episodes a week? <laughs> yeah, I doubt it. I stage. don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Just content coming out our ears at Unlucky this stage. Hask. Just love talking about rugby. So Pat, um, did you get to watch any rugby the weekend? I see James Ryan got his career back on track, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Back to the win. Yeah, he's no longer a loser. <laughs> I'd say he, I'd say word filter to him that you would be in, on his case there, and yeah, that was he actually he played seventy seven minutes of that game, so he was not leaving that pitch until he was a winner at good, the weekend. Good, good, James. <coughs> Get your finger out. <laughs> <laughs> but they, um, yeah, that was a good game. And then just to the Leinster production line comes up with another another lad, Conor O'Brien, came on. Because Rob Kearney had a, he actually was having a good game. Another nice line break, uh, beat a couple of lads. And then um, I think it's a Kiwi hooker just absolutely flattened them from the side. And he didn't get up after that, uh, came off. Maybe he wouldn't have went to Chicago anyway, but... Um, definitely wasn't going to Chicago <coughs> after that. So how bad did it look? Is is he a concern? Yeah, he was. It. He was down. Uh, a couple of Leinster medics came on, and he was holding his shoulder because um, he, he just made a line break, and then just from the side, I think it's Favia was his name, and he came and just just took him out from the side, like a decent enough tackle. But uh, Carney just then, I think maybe because it's Treviso, they're winning at that stage. I said, let's take him off to be sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's been no. I think Leinster probably issue a medical update. I'd say about that as well. But it's one of those um, ones like where. When you go to those games over there, they're after a big Champions Cup weekend, yeah. it's a tough place to go. And the one thing you want is a win, but it's to not take any casualties. So mm. I don't think it would be too bad. So if it isn't, I think Leinster would be absolutely delighted with getting the, the bonus point win over there and, and uh, blooding a few young players. Yeah, Conor O'Brien, yeah. Another <coughs> lad comes out of nowhere, comes on for Kearney, gets himself a try. Like, yeah. It's just like, it's great yeah, finish, they actually, popped yeah. another one out, yeah. Mm. I mean, a Leinster young fella coming through, is he good enough to stay at Leinster? Will we see him <laughs> <laughs> at one of the other provinces? <laughs> I suppose. Just three, uh, like the, the hotline, the let Leinster going, like, you know, three phone calls from the coaches, like, do you need him for yeah. the next season at all? Or, yeah. Um, so yeah, I know he was he was good, but yeah, I was, I was interested in that as well. Like it's, it was like a dirty, like it was just rain, 
hardly anybody in the crowd. Like, you know, on the TV cameras, everybody's in the covered stands. So it's just empty everywhere else in the ground. I was just kind of thinking from your perspective, what's it like kind of playing in those games it's over there? tough, Pat. Um, from an Austin perspective, we, we've got beaten over there once or twice by Zebra or Treviso, but um, you're kind of on a hiding to nothing, really. If you if you win, you're expected to win and win with a bonus point over there. For mm. some reason, it, that's skewed because it's not that easy. And if anything less, if you scrape a win, you know you've been you've, you get slated really. Uh, I remember actually one of the games a couple of years ago. Um, Stephen Ferris was on uh, on commentary, and he said before, "I'm expecting five points from Ulster today," <laughs> and it just it 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 kind of kind of I don't know it just distorts people's perception of how difficult a place it is to go mm. you have to go there and you have to get the job done and you're often depleted and it could be you know after Europe for a couple of weeks it's a tough place to go and going over there and getting the job done I, last season actually <laughs> I captained the side that went to Zebra and got beat and for nice, me nice. so I ended up retiring point. I retired at the end of the season <laughs> and the Zebra game was the beginning of the end <laughs> for me I was they stopped talking crap. doing stuff <laughs> I was so bad, to be oh, fair, yeah. most of us were pretty bad, yeah. but um, I, oh, was, well, they I was leading the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, they upped their game as well, you know, I think in fairness, they, you know, they, for, that, for Zebra or for, uh, for Treviso, you know, getting a big Irish team over there and taking a scalp, whether they're depleted or not, is huge for them. And you saw the way <clears throat> uh, Treviso played at the weekend. Yeah. The defence was ferocious and I think they got un unlucky in the first half with a couple of referee decisions, it could have been a different outcome. But uh, yeah, I would always say, you know, big kudos to anyone that goes over there, especially Lens for the weekend, with, with, not, with not having their full strength team out and come out with that kind of a win. Um, yeah. Another guy, um, um, the, the centre, the American centre, um, Emmerich, Paul, Paul Emmerich, Emmerich yeah, yeah. played at uh, Parma for a while. Yeah. And he tells a story about how he um, kind of, again, had another encounter with kind of mob guys <laughs> a made man but <laughs> yeah and he, yeah exactly he said he was on a night out in parma and uh, some guy pulled up on a on a moped on a vespa <laughs> so gangster <laughs> isn't it <laughs> yeah, yeah and he was like revving it and stuff to like intimidate <laughs> emmerich so this guy came over and uh, he he kind of like they got into an argument and emmerich pushed him off his scooter <laughs> he fell backwards <laughs> and like wrecked himself and then emmerich ran off I don't know exactly how that finished but I'm sure he went to bed that night and thought there will be no um, gangster related <laughs> fallout from this encounter <laughs> and then on Monday morning then Emmerich went into training and uh, one of the guys uh, one of the guys in his team said hey Paul uh, did you have much of a weekend he's like yeah yeah quite enough and he said did you get into a fight because he said you hit the wrong man <laughs> and then it turned out Mobster, a gangster. mobster, whatever. What yeah. Called, yeah, I don't know what the kids are calling them nowadays. Yeah, yeah. But um, Emmerich then had to go and meet this guy to pay him compensation. Unreal. Yeah, and he had to meet him in the kitchen of an Italian restaurant. <laughs> oh my gosh! Is this another Nick Williams story? <laughs> and he like, had his gun taped to the jacks, and so yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the Nick Williams one, I'm not sure about. Right. I'm. I'm. I'm very sure about the American one. Vespa. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I, the Italian, Italian restaurant. Yeah, that's that's like. I, I might have made. I might have. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember Emmerich telling me a story. I just remember hearing the story from Nick Williams. Right. But wow. God. Yeah. Listen, there's luck on in Italian rugby. Yeah. There's actually yeah. It looks, here looks first. pretty kind of t tepid from when you're watching it on TV. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's what's going on behind the camera. It's behind the scenes. on those yeah. games. Yeah. Let me tell you. Um, With the um, of all the games, I kind of <clears throat> caught highlights of it now. But saw all the other games. I missed the the Ulster game. I only kind of got got bits and pieces of that game. But. Um, yeah, Henry Spate looks like he's kind of, at least he's given him value for money anyway before he goes, and Max Phillips doing a good job when he gets the chance, but um, yeah, they, they look decent enough. You guys are kind of the Addison fan club, it's kind yeah. of going well, and another decent game for him. Absolutely, uh, as you say, Johnny McPhillips, he's been very unlucky this season not to get mm. uh, much game time, because I thought he was one of the few guys standing up last year, and yeah. uh, whenever the rest of the team weren't performing, he was still doing a really good job. And he's just been unlucky. Billy Burns has come in and done really well. I think he's standout for me, uh, McPhillips. Yeah. I think his speed of pass, his uh, he always has an option inside. He'll show you know his movement of the ball in his hands. He's so active around the back of the ruck. 
his jumper from and his timing with uh, when he makes a, a dart right or left is perfect. Just keeps the the defence sitting back. I think all the time, um, and his speed of pass, like zipping those backdoor passes to Addison or to Lowry. Yeah. Um, and he's always taking different options as well. I, I yeah. think he's absolute ball to feel. He probably he's he's in a luxurious position where he's got either McCluskey, he's got Addison mm. outside him, he's got now he's got Laurie. Yeah. Obviously, Mikey picked up an injury there, so yeah. real shame because he was just starting to get yeah. into his stride and get a bit of a Great feel try for him. Again, for another brilliant step. Like yeah. What speed he has and yeah. Um, Addison he'd a great break for uh, for Shanahan's try. Yeah. Um, get timing of offload as well there. I think like he. Throwing dummies, yeah. you know what? There's not enough dummies in this game. Uh, yeah. just, he just kept throwing them, and people just dropping left, right, and centre, and then eventually he just offloads this handy little little one hand pass. But I was very impressed with Ulster again. Again, their intent to play, really enjoy watching them. Um, and you a big you were um, you had a bit of an issue with um, uh, some commentary at the weekend. Mark Ronson, Robson's uh, <laughs> Ronson. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Robson's uh, Mark Robson's chat is is always pretty funny, but um, funny in kind of like a cringy uncle kind of way. But uh, yeah, he did a lot of Halloween kind of related comments at the weekend, like Michael Lowry's full of tricks and treats, <laughs> and he's away. I think he said someone's away on his broomstick there at one point, uh, which just cracks me up. A yeah. week out from Halloween as well. Like yeah, yeah like it's yeah, not yeah. like it's on Halloween night. It's just like. Feck it, I'm going to say it anyway. Yeah. I've, I've prepared these jokes. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I've done all this homework. Yeah. yeah, He got in bother there recently whenever I was in Uh It was the Connacht game at uh, Kingspan and uh, he was talking about how Connacht hadn't beat uh, Ulster in Belfast since 1960. Yeah, He said 1960, um, Gary Lineker was born, uh, Maradona, um, Kenneth Branagh. And then he said, Jeffrey Dahmer and <laughs> Richie Ramirez. <laughs> and then he said... Who's um, Richie Ramirez? The Night another? Stalker, is that him? He was a serial killer. Oh, he's another yeah. serial killer. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, and then he said, uh, 1960 was a great year for serial killers. <laughs> <laughs> During the match? During the game, yeah. Oh we were like, this God. is brilliant. This cl It's class. That's yeah. brilliant. Great stuff. Yeah. And we kind of thought, I don't know how to answer that, but I'm enjoying it. Yeah, okay, yeah, I don't know yeah. how to follow up. But uh, then a couple of minutes later, we just heard over the over the earphone, um, uh, Robbo, you're gonna have to apologise for that. <laughs> <laughs> so he had to say sorry, as if like, there's some serial killer Ulster supporters yeah. sitting at home going, "How dare, dare he, he speak about us like that? We have feelings too." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he got on bother. He was he was reeling about that one. Oh re yeah, I'd say he doesn't care what he says now at this stage. He's been at it so long. He's a big fan of yours, Robbo. Is he? Yeah. Go away. Yeah, he said you were the Gary Ringrose of your generation. Oh, I'll take that. High praise. Know, I'm a massive, High praise because massive Ringrose fan. Yeah, so. and Gary Ringrose is the Brown O'Driscoll of his generation. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> so <Does> that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it, whatever it means. Uh, we'll tell him I'm a massive fan as well. Yeah, yeah. I'll put you in touch, and you can. Dude, we should get him on the show. Absolutely, yes. he'd be great to Perfect. be on the show. Perfect. Anything else, Pat? Yeah, it would be, like I was watching the the Connacht game there as well, and. Um, we got sports file to send us in um, books. You know, like they, have a, they have a book out for, for Christmas, like great rugby moments. <coughs> and uh, so we'd kind of run a competition on the House of Rugby side. And I was watching the Connacht game back and they were dreadful for 65 minutes. But I knew there was going to be a couple of tries scored. And then we had someone buzz at the offices and I had to drop down the book to him. A uh, guy, Daryl, he, he was one of our followers of, of House of Rugby, came back and Connacht had scored those two tries that I knew were coming. You know, like, but I'd yeah. missed them, so I'd missed the only good part of the game, and then for the next ten the minutes, <laughs> they were they were bad again. Like, but uh, I just thought, yeah, it was a real tight ground, bridge end. The grass was a little bit longer. Ospreys had a great kicking tactic. I like, kept kicking the ball in behind them, kept kicking for Adi Aloka, knee Adi Aloka. Every time they got the ball, spotted him, kicked it to him. And there was one moment I thought was very funny where uh, Adi Aloka just took a high ball. He, he shelled a couple, but he took a high ball. And then he just saw two boys coming at him and just tried to call a late mark like that. And the ref was like, no, it's too late. And he got bounded Jeez. all in the space of a couple of seconds. Like, but, uh, oh, the mark can be confusing, yeah. can't it? When it's like, it? yeah, when can, you do, when can you call it? How much time do you have to call it? Like, so I was kind of wondering, did that kind of stuff ever happen to you boys? Uh, you know, just seeing someone coming in your direction and trying to call a mark at the last second. I hated having to call marks. Because, yeah, there was, a, there was a time there when it was, you didn't know whether you could get off the ground or what. And mm. I did you play in those days, did you? Yeah. 
did you play when you had to make a mark? <laughs> oh, <laughs> on the fish? <laughs> you did not. <laughs> no. <laughs> Another Nick Williams story. Uh, those were the I, days. I remember one against, we played against uh, Sale in Thoman Park, I think it was around 2008, 2009, and we were giving them a bit of a bait and, and Sebastian Chabelle was playing for that time and he was back in their 22 when we put a, a big high long kick a bit too long and it went to him we had a good line chasing up and I presumed that he would call a mark or there was that little split second where he didn't know what he was going to do and I think Chabelle is one of those players that he's unreal he's very physical and he's physically talented but I don't think he knows the rules sometimes <laughs> you know <laughs> he's one of those kind of players so he didn't know whether he should call a mark or something and I kind of knew that so he kind of caught it and there was this brief moment of of knowing it was going to happen and he just stood there and he growled at us <laughs> he just kind of went rawr, rawr, rawr. <laughs> and I actually started laughing uh, I remember Luke McAllister was standing beside him and he was just like what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and then everyone just jumped on him and we tackled him into touch. And that was my, yeah, one of my favorite moments in Thorn Park. I'll have to go back and see if I can find this clip. Yeah, yeah. Just like a, like a bear. Rawr, rawr. Rawr. And you're like, I don't think that's allowed. I'm going to tackle you anyway here. Like, um, yeah, it got pounded. Like, and, but yeah, like, because yeah, you surely you'd have the thing where you're targeted every now and then or the ball keeps coming your way or, but, uh, yeah, it, it is a big tactic for teams, isn't it? Just putting it high up, let's test Trimble out here. Or Have you ever had that before? You mean specifically yeah. me? Let's test Trimble. Oh, I remember always. actually playing the Ospreys. Uh, and I had, so Tommy had just left and was playing for the Ospreys. Tommy knew me very well at the time, obviously. And I had just moved from centre to the wing. So there was a few kind of nuances. Even just high ball reception, was, I was just kind of getting, getting mm -hmm. a grips with it. And it was coming into the game more. Whereas before, kind of, no one really did that for some, yeah. for some reason. Yeah, tennis for a while, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I remember one game of a restart, uh, James Hook was about to kick, kick, um, kick off, and he looked at Tommy, and he obviously, he obviously, Tommy had obviously said to him, Trimble can't catch. <laughs> Sorry, <man. laughs> yeah, and, but then Hook obviously, he wasn't sure which one was Trimble. All right. So he looks at Tommy and he goes, <laughs> For those there? listening, there was a nod there. Yeah. That guy's and I, there. I looked at it, I thought, I know what's going on there. <laughs> Tommy has screwed me over. <laughs> he denies it to this day, but I know, <laughs> I know what's going on. To be fair to him, he wasn't wrong, was he? Believe it or not, <laughs> I caught that one. Yes. <laughs> of course he did. The, um, the other game I, we, were, we kind of chatted a little bit over the weekend was the, the All Blacks game against... Um, dropping them in Japan to play the third Bledisloe game against Australia, but you know they're only a couple of weeks away from coming here. But um, just looked so impressive again, scoring tries in the last five minutes of the first half as well, and um, just loved the shit house tactics from the All Blacks as well, like the dirty tactics and taking guys out off the ball as well. And um, yeah, the one I liked was uh, the scrum where they all started to go one way, shape back in the other direction. And uh, Liam Squire just came around the back of the scrum and just took Jack Dempsey out and was just like, "You ain't taking part in this play." Like, and yeah. and then they, well, they still needed Rico Iwane to make a break, and he did so, and and I think he got barred away for one of his tries. But just love that type of stuff from the All Blacks. Mm. Like, you know, Ireland are going to be getting, you know, their faces rubbed in it there in a couple of weeks now. Like, so um, <coughs> as great as they are, it's, I actually love that they can do the dirty stuff as well. Yeah, I, I actually have to agree with you completely. Like when people lose their minds on Twitter, which they did over the weekend because of that moment, and I think the Aaron Smith moment where he took a, a block, he just ran straight across half the, the Aussie back mm. line as they were trying to, to scramble back to, to catch Ben Smith. And he blatantly changed his line of running and uh, blocked them off. And then you'd the yellow card for the, for the Aussie hooker that came on, which, you know, he was in. in, in antagonized as well to, to yeah. do that and it was like well at the same time there it's like of a book they just know when to do it when to turn the screw and um you know a fair play to the aussies i thought they came out and they, you got to play against new zealand and they mm. went at them like they really they you know and it shows ireland as you said they're playing them in a couple of weeks what kind of way <coughs> ireland have to go about it and it is um you got to go out and play and tend rugby got to have a go at mm. them they got australia probably lost it in the green zone, they're a bit too panicky. Uh, Foley tended to kind of throw wild passes. As far as to take anything from that, from Ireland's pr perspective, it would be once they get into that green zone, is they gotta 
take control then, cool the Jets to a certain extent, not throw those wild passes, allow the likes of Sexton and uh, whoever's playing at nine and maybe another back to make those big decisions. Yeah. Um, after fourth or fifth phase or sixth phase in the, in the green zone, but, but uh, that's where that's where Ireland thrive though. When they get in the green zone, yeah, they come away with points more often than not. And again, in the past, it's because you've got obviously Schmidt uh, pulling the strings, Sexton and Murray. So big um, kind of responsibility on whoever it is running that 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 nine Cooney McGrath Marmion, mm. whoever it is, kind of organising that and running that and kind of being as efficient and stingy and kind of ruthless in that mm. uh, green zone as Ireland have been for the last couple of years but just um, the, the New Zealand Australia rivalry is it's never going to be matched really but mm. the New Zealand Ireland rivalry is really kind of getting more intense and yeah. kind of there's more yeah. going on off the pitch and there's more chat um, <clears throat> we experienced that a couple of years ago after we, we beat them in Chicago then we played them in Dublin two weeks later and they were fired up That's that was right. when um, Zebo got yeah. his head taken off. Yeah. And um Henshaw got oh no, was it Jared Payne or Henshaw got KO Henshaw, Henshaw got yeah, KO early in the game, yeah. the shoulder yeah. to the head, yeah. Yeah. And then um when they scored early on in the game, Israel Dag was screaming in our faces, you know, and mm. we were going again, it's it kind of similar to what we we're talking about earlier on with the Munster Leinster, Ulster Leinster, the rivalry. They had they had so much respect for us mm. that that they were so fired up. It was, it's almost wow, we're on their radar. Yeah. Whereas before, we wouldn't have even. They would have just thought we'll we'll probably beat Ireland. We'll do a research. Obviously, we'll know the players. We'll know the way they play. But now Ireland are are a threat. Mm. You know, I still don't think Ireland are the favourites. But the rivalry is such that New Zealand really take that seriously. And again, Joe is a big reason for that. Yeah. There was a time when I was in um, the 2012 tour. Uh, when they went down to play the All Blacks three times, and um, I was chatting to Nanu Man Anu there, um, and just kind of saying, "Any Irish guys you're looking out for? Any guys we should would keep keep an eye on?" And he just goes, uh, "Yeah, yeah, Paul O'Connell, he's a good player, like you know." And I was like, "Oh, Paul O'Connell's out. He's he's injured, like." And he goes, "Yeah, oh, the rest of those guys are pretty good." <laughs> <You're just> like, <laughs> you don't know any of us, do you? Uh, like, and it was just that thing. And I, I remember Brian O'Driscoll used to say that. It's like. They don't respect us, and why should they? You know, because we yeah. haven't beat them yet. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, I remember when we were playing uh, South Africa a couple of years ago. JP Peters. I think journalists love that. <laughs> love putting guys on the spot and saying, yeah. "Oh, tell us who specifically, apart from O'Connell and O'Driscoll, mm-hmm. who are you looking out for?" And then uh, JP Pe- JP Peterson was put on the spot, and he said. Um, I, apparently he was talking about me, <laughs> but he didn't know my name. Oh! And I, apparently he called me um, David Skrella, <laughs> <laughs> the French the ten, French, wasn't it? Yeah, was he Toulouse? Yeah, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And someone put it together, and they're like, I think he means, I think he means Trimble. Okay, right. <laughs> or was Strettle called, maybe? It's like a, was the Strettle the player? David for, Strettle, yeah. 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 I'd say he just kind of mashed it all together because yeah. he's yeah. blonde. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That could be <laughs> it. Mystery solved. There you go. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, nice. that's, that's South African arrogance there, isn't it? Like just to kind of, uh, who are they as well? But the, the other one I was kind of getting was the, um, when I was listening back to the House of Rugby English version yeah. um, last week was uh, Haskell was talking, James Haskell was on and he had a, a bee in his bonnet about English arrogance and <coughs> this perceived thing where um, everybody thinks that the English are these kind of guys that kind of look down their nose and everybody and they're the bad guys and um, yeah I think it's a, we, we have a clip of it here I think it'd be an interesting one to have you guys have a listen to and talk about. I will ask one thing I, I'm always interested about the English arrogance thing um, just bec- in having been lucky enough to play for England and it's something that's levelled against the team a lot it's almost uh, I found playing for England we're, we're often apologetic yeah. Playing for England, it's the complete opposite. Uh, I'm, you know, we're often on the receiving end of quite a lot of what I would class as arrogance. Because I mean, you know why everyone <coughs> hates England because of you know 500 years of empire building, um, and and nobody likes England, and that's that's something you come to terms with as a as a player. And everyone wants to beat you. Yeah. There's nothing better than beating England, and everyone says our oh, arrogant English. But actually, you know, I've seen things and a little bits and pieces against teams I played for where I'm thinking if I did that or I conducted myself in that way it would be um, you know it would be a nightmare that would be kind of in the newspaper kind give, of stuff give us an example <laughs> 
Um, well, no, I mean, I, I've actually got something saved up for the, <laughs> the, 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 for the Six Nations, but I, I remember just watching a video of some people singing a song uh, essentially assaulting I- I England, and I was thinking if we did that, yeah. that would be just terrible. Um, and I just think that it's, it's interesting, everyone does talk about this English arrogance, where I find as an England player... We just we do everything not to show that, and I think it would help the team sometimes. I think it would be quite good Isn't to that have what that. Eddie came in and instilled though was a bit of get your jaw jutting again and. Yes, he did. He did in terms of having that confidence and what we should be doing. But if you always watch, um, you know, I think in my first uh, time with him until we won the Grand Slam, yeah, was the only time we celebrated after a game. The only time, if you watch back all the footage of everything, literally posing for the photo at the end of the thing with whatever it might be, Calcutta Cup and whatever, no smiles, business on, no celebrating, no whooping, no in your face, no nothing. And that was the same, even in Australia, same thing, finish the game, business. Even the Six Nations, business, 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 until we actually got um, some silverware and the job was done. Yeah. So I think it's interesting with the English arrogance. I think... Um, you know, I remember I, I saw an article once uh, and I stupidly looked at the comments on it. It was an article about myself, obviously arrogance and arro- <laughs> uh, ego got a bit the better of me and I decided to look at it because it, and it, it said at the bottom in the comments in, section. In your daily Haskell Google. In the daily Haskell Google, <laughs> yeah, when my the alerts go up. And it said in the article it was about m- myself and English rugby and in the bottom the comments section, which you should never go and, and why, ever. Why would you ever, ever do because that? Because I realise that's where people's souls go to die. Like people who log on to, to newspaper articles and set up a profile and comment, they are the worst of the worst of the worst. There's a, there's a space in hell reserved for them. And this person said, you can sum up the problem with English sport, right? Not just rugby, but English sport <laughs> and English rugby in two words James Haskell and I was like so essentially did you, did you up like it is sort of get <laughs> I did, I was I was trying to get up because it was a name mention but I thought I was actually blown away by that I thought I am responsible for what everybody hates England yeah so um, you could just hear James going on uh, interested in he's creeping around uh, online comment sections as yeah, well yeah. but um, yeah this whole thing of like that uh the English are the bad guys and they're always a team to beat as well like is it still that way because I was looking back at Haskell's record and like he's played Ireland nine times, won four, lost five. Like so, it's not this kind of thing that they're the dominant team anymore. But are England still the team like that you want to beat when you you know you're going into a Test match? Yeah, I think England are. I don't. I wouldn't buy too much into um, the whole tradition and the, the old enemy, and I wouldn't get too carried away with that. When you get on the pitch, they're just <laughs> they're just normal fellas. They've just got this reputation, and. I suppose maybe, as he says, <laughs> summed up in Haskell. I don't know why. Um, he actually, Joe seemed to be doing wonders for his brand. He, <laughs> he's doing really Haskell well on the podcast. He's obviously he plays up to it as well. I think that's yeah. it's banter for more than anything. Mm. I think that that rivalry, and I think the fans play up to it, players play up to it, and uh, you know, it's like it, as he said, it does go back a long time with that empire building. <laughs> attitude, the Irish relationship with England is quite... I think Tommy Tiernan summed it up before for me when he was like, uh, we like to see the English lose at things like sport and war. And I was like, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's it's never going to stop, I don't think, but it is kind of a... I think, a yeah, it's, it's almost like they don't get the same history lessons. Like, you know, why would they in their history lessons go on about, yeah, and we screwed over this country here now, they're just going to do their own thing, but yeah. their history lessons are all about... Mm. Well, we got these boys came over and you know kicked the crap out of us here and did this here. Like so, I remember talking to um, yeah, just like a, a girl before about you know why didn't we support England if they support us? And you're like because X, Y, and Z. And she's like, oh, I, d- I didn't know that as well. <laughs> but like, is there? They always seem to be that team to beat. But it, again, like I think when Eddie Jones came in and it worked for a couple of years, like short term anyway. Um, like who knows how it's going to go from going into the World Cup? But he kind of. He played on that, didn't he? Like he, he actually brought the bad boys back in and Hartley yeah. and, mm. and Brown and, and Haskell and stuff like that. Yeah. And they came in and they just kind of, let's, everybody hates us, so let's play up to it. I think that's how it kind of worked for a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, they, they embraced it. I think it's, that's a kind of fairly strategic tactic mm. from them. Just embrace it. This is who we are. Um, no one likes us. <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to change. That's the way we are. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I thought it, I thought it was good, but... Um, yeah, and he also, I think, he called you out, I think, on that show about... Uh, he did, yeah. He's, he's found out that you've been... I've been trolling him. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's been trolling him, <laughs> <laughs> to be fair. And so many people are trolling him that he didn't even spot that I'd been trolling him. It just it just slipped in there amongst other comments. How do you troll him? <clears throat> just David Brent references. 
underneath his Instagram post. Yeah, and so on. with a you know an anonymous account. <laughs> Spineless. Standard, <laughs> standard trolling. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Haskell. Go on. Um, uh, James, is it true that you um, do a, a great Rob Howley impression? And if you do, we'd love to hear it, please. Excellent. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. Well, we mentioned earlier before we headed to Chicago, um, Pat got to speak with Gary Ringrose last week at the launch of Ireland's new home and alternative jerseys made by Canterbury. So we're going to have a quick listen to that now. Good start to the season. Got to try try there recently enough at the weekend and um, looks like it's gone pretty well for you already. Happy that you've able to had a run into it as well and doing well. Yeah, it was um, off the back of the tour, which seems like a while ago now. So it was a couple of weeks of, of tough training and, and everyone on the tour is pretty keen to get back playing as soon as possible. So um, luckily enough, it, it's been OK. Obviously not with the the game against Scarlets. It's not ideal, but the, it's a good start so far. Um, still a lot to improve and, and kind of as a group we're learning loads each game and, and seeing you know, a ton of areas that need improvement uh, I mean, particularly going into this week now and, and the games ahead is a pretty hectic schedule so we'll have to do whatever we can to kind of be at our best mm. and, and we're talking to Jason Cowman there um, earlier in the week he was talking about all your the player management plan and how that's worked out as well do you guys have an input on that like I know you've probably asked for your opinion and stuff but like is most of it just like listen I'm playing this week this is what I've been told is that how it works uh, oh yeah, sure. It's I mean selection is something that's never in your control, and mm. um, yeah, no, I've no no players ever able to pick themselves or not. So you kind of just work as hard to to be in as best posi uh, position physically possible available for selection, and then kind of the rest is sort of out of your hands. And um, with the schedule, I mean, such tough games that that kind of there's such an emphasis on recovery and and rehab and staying in, in shape and injury free. So kind of the responsibility is on the players to do what they can there and, and the rest is out of their control and so there's no point really worrying about it or, or overthinking about it. And have you ever at any stage of your career, even back in schools or anything like that, ever felt the need to go and ask why you weren't playing in a certain position or weren't even playing as well? Have you ever been slapped down for doing something like that? Um, uh, I've been, over the years been dropped and selected and picked some weeks, not others, so mm. it's, it's just part and parcel of it. And, as in you focus on on training as hard as you can and, and keep improving those those areas and as well as staying in best shape possible with through recovery and, and rehab stuff like that so um you kind of just do what you're told you know what i mean it's it's my job or, or our job anyway to be the best version of ourselves it's not our job to pick the team or, or anything like that so we just sit back and, and do what are told and, and the likes again as we mentioned of someone like james and dan levy and the boys who all broke through that last season as well when you're getting back for pre-season training what's it like again i know everybody kind of talks about this kind of mentality that, that's there in leinster as well but are you guys really pushing each other hard and is there like hard words even said in pre in pre-season as well um yeah well, well we're incredibly lucky at leinster with the the competition there and right across the team and, and certainly at center now with with joe tamani and, and and then tom daly as well finished the end of, came back the end of last year with his, with his acl and but it's good to go um sorry if he's good to go from from now along with the rake of other centers so there's there's a lot of competition in there so um yeah we're all working incredibly hard to to be lucky enough to be selected and then and then obviously try and perform at our best as well so it's uh yeah there's no complacency or anyone getting comfortable amongst the group and just the last one for me then is just the whole kind of uh slate of games that's coming up in november and um, you're over there in chicago for that game against new zealand as well but how great would it be to be involved against them at the aviva stadium yeah it would be i mean you always dream of, of playing against uh, the all blacks or playing against new zealand uh, they're number one for a reason it's always a tough game and and it's kind of a it's a pretty tough test along with i mean the other four four games as well there's no easy game amongst the series so um well from personally to be to be lucky enough to get involved in any of them would be delighted but i, I think at the end of the day you don't really certainly in this position now you don't really look forward or worry about them it's kind of focusing on the province and and, and ultimately trying to put your hand up for selection there try and do as best you can for the province and then as i was saying with regards to selection it's kind of out of your control whatever happens there it's it's yeah it's just don't worry about it too much okay but it's time for our guinness made of more player of the week uh we put out a poll on monday after all the guinness pro 14 games and asked for your top performer pat the results the results i've got them here um yeah, we had this this week. It was James Tracy, uh, Stuart McCloskey, um, 
Peter O'Mahony and Rory Scannell. Um, Dubai, Mr. over in Dubai at the moment, heading to South Africa, and uh, Scannell won it. Scannell got 42% of the vote, and I think Fair enough. that kick probably got him a yeah. good few percent anyway. Yeah. So balls so. of steel, Scannell. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think you can't go, you can't go wrong with that. It was, uh, it was some, some effort after 80 minutes and to get a huge win for Munster. So behind that, yeah, fair enough. We'll have to come up with some kind of prize or something like that. Yeah, I was thinking that. Yeah, yeah. No, like a, we're like, oh, well done, Roy. Well, a trophy, yeah. Joe, a Joe pillow. You're getting a Joe pillow. Pillow. Okay, now it's time for hashtag Ask HOR. Pat, have we any questions from Twitter? Yeah, we, we got a few in there. Um, so thanks everybody for that. Um, first one is Willie. Uh, his Twitter handle is at ChelseaFan50. And he wants to know, uh, 40 years since the All Blacks were beaten by Munster, and he's wondering why there was no anniversary game or no, no kind of game, especially with the All Blacks being over, to commemorate that result. It would be a great idea. Is it, is it, 50, it is 78, 40 years. yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, it's a shame they couldn't hook something up there, isn't it? They're afraid we'd beat them, I'd say. That's probably what it is. We came so close the last time. Um, we raised the hearts and souls of the nation, and then we dashed them. Um, yeah, that would be unreal. I don't know if that's going to ever happen again, really, is it? With the, the midweek games, it's... That seems like it's something that's... You got your play, didn't you? We did, we did. <laughs> Just leave it at that, would you? <laughs> <laughs> play is still going in New York, I believe. Oh, uh, yeah, so uh, good call, Willie, but um, I sure look, we'll go for a few pints and celebrate all, all the same. Is it, is it Willie... Is it at Willie, a.k.a. Chelsea Fan 50? Is that... I, I, think, it's, I think it's just at Chelsea Fan 50. Okay. I actually know who that is. <laughs> oh, God. I do, I do. Hi, Willie. I hope you're well, man. <laughs> um, Huge Chelsea fan. Michael, what is it? Uh, Michael Harry, he, he asked us, um, do, any, do you guys think, or even myself as well, that Wales could be dark horses for the 2019 World Cup? Yeah, I think I responded to him on Twitter about oh, this. Yeah. Um, they, could, they could. I mean, who, who knows? I, mean, uh, I think the Autumn Internationals would tell a lot, right? Uh, they've got Australia, Scotland, um, which would be two big tests of Australia and they're in their World Cup group. So I think if they can beat them, they can get out of that group. Mm. So it'll be interesting to see. I haven't seen a huge amount of them, obviously, since uh, since the Six Nations last year, which they were pretty pretty strong and they were very <coughs> close to winning it. So, yeah, what do you think? Well, traditionally, they struggle in, in the autumn and then between the autumn and Six Nations, then they improve mm -hmm. massively. So if that happens, then they'll be peaking at the right time. But, yeah, obviously... On a side like wheels, there's enough strength there to do a bit of damage. Mm -hmm. And we had um, Andrew Kiley, he got onto us there and late last night and he said, John Ryan is getting the shout uh, for Ireland, like Ireland often call him into the squad, but Stephen Archer still isn't kind of getting in there and he kind of wonders why Archer maybe isn't, you know, in Joe Schmidt's good books at the moment. Yeah, that's, that's, it is a little bit strange, I suppose. Mm. Um, one coach sees value in kind of one, uh, trait that one player's bringing and then the other one kind of maybe just slightly different styles. Honestly, I'm not sure we're qualified to, to comment on, on front <laughs> rowers or tight heads. No notion, yeah. yeah. All I could think of was just maybe a couple of, ah, like I, I say, Ryan probably comes in and does a job for Joe, you know, I kind of think if you trust guys, like oh, I was thinking was a couple of disciplinary things re recently for Archer, like where he kind of was given away penalties or got yellow carded there in the Champions Cup, but, but I think Joe always would have went with, with Ryan anyway. Ryan probably trusts him a little bit more, so... Um, that's that's my take on it anyway. But the the final one we had actually was from Fiona Steed, and she's asked us, "Will there be any more John Hayes stories?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we should actually have a weekly thing with John Hayes. Imagine it's getting John Hayes in the couch. That's what we should do. Wow. Yeah, I love I love the fact that he's got his wife to stand up for him yeah. on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, for anyone who doesn't realise that that's John Hayes' wife, Fiona. Who uh, is always fighting battles for me, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Um, keep, keep them coming, Fiona. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could do it a few more dirty stories on, on Hazy, but yeah, let's, let's get him in here to talk, to defend himself without his wife. Mm -hmm. I'll give up. I actually don't think there'd be room for me on this couch <laughs> yeah, if you yeah. came and sat here. Um, but yeah, that's it. So, so thanks everybody for that. And um, yeah, keep them coming. Keep them coming next week as well. It's November games, so I'm sure we'll be flooded with questions now about selections and who should start and stuff like that as well. So it should be good. Yep. 
Okay, right. Thank you, everybody, for your comments, uh, for your questions, for listening, and for uh, watching on YouTube. Thank you to everyone uh, who is responsible for putting this show together. Big thanks there. Thank you to Pat for coming on and for putting all this together. This has been Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness, and we'll see you on Thursday.